Okay, let's get going on chapter 10. So, chapter 10 is about the risks and return of individual securities. So, let's start by talking about returns. Typically, when you make an investment, you can get return on that investment in one of two ways, and you could get them both, right? You, they could have both happen. You can either get payments from that investment, or you can just uh, wait and sell the investment at the end and get what's called a capital gain. For example, when you buy a house and you hold on to it for 10 years and then you sell it for a higher price, that extra amount of money you get there is a capital gain. Well, let's say that you bought a house to rent out. Then you would have both kinds of return. You would have monthly payments. What would the monthly payments be? Yeah, the rent. And then the capital gain would be the difference between the sale price and what you paid for it. And so you would have two kinds of returns for there, for, uh, for uh, a rental house. So for the purposes of the following discussion, we're going to use stocks as our example. But you can do this for basically anything. First, let's talk about dollar returns. And that's your return on the investment stated in dollars. Now, what are dollar returns good for? They're good for knowing how much extra stuff you can consume based on this investment. So let's talk about an example here. You, can, you buy 100 shares at $37 a share. The stock pays an annual dividend of $1.85 per share. At the end of the year, the stock is selling for $40.33. Do we have a return in the form of payments here? Oh, come on. Yeah, the dividends. And do we have a return in uh, the form of capital gain? Yeah, so going from 37 up to $40.33, that's our capital gain. So for each share, we're gaining $1.85 in dividends, and we are gaining $3.33 for the capital gain. What's our dollar gain per share then? I'm going to add those two things together, and I think it's, what, $5.18? Does that sound right? Yeah, now, keep in mind, how many shares did we have here? 100. And so what does that mean our total dollar return for this investment is? It's $518. Now, let's, uh, let's give an example of why this doesn't tell us everything we need to know. You and I are at the cocktail party, and we are talking about our investments because this is what middle-aged, middle-class people do, right? Talk about their investments. And uh, I tell you that I had total dollar returns on an individual investment of 518. Do you know whether to be impressed? No, why not? You know what the initial investment was? Yeah, you don't know what the initial investment was. If you ask me the initial investment and I say, oh, I invested $100, are you impressed? Oh my goodness, it's 518, 518%. Well, anyway, it's huge. Now, what if I tell you that I invested a million dollars to get that 518? You'd say, you dumbass, I get a better return than that on my checking account, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so we don't know whether to be impressed, but dollar returns do tell us how much more we can consume. Now, let's talk about percentage returns, try to solve this problem. And uh, we can actually, for stocks, we can break it down into two pieces. And the first piece is called the dividend yield. People freak out when they see these little subscripts like T plus 1 and T. Don't freak out. All that means is that the dividend happens one period later than the price. And why are we dividing by the price at the beginning of the period? That's what we had to invest in order to be able to collect that dividend at the end of the period. And so that's how we're going to figure our return, is to take that dividend from the end of the year and divide by the price at the beginning of the year. Simple, simple, simple. And then we have the percentage returns uh, from capital gains. 
and we have a name for that. It's the capital gains yield. And it's a little more tricky than dividend yield. What we're going to do is take the price at the end of the year, subtract the price at the beginning of the year, and divide by the price at the beginning of the year. So that's all that T plus one and T stuff means is end of year, beginning of year. And then, if I just want to find the total percentage return on the stock, all I have to do is add those two things together, and that will give me my total percentage return, dividend yield and capital gains yield. So, let's figure this out for our stock. The dividend at the end of the year is $1.85. Price at the beginning of the year is 37 and so when I take 1.85 divided by 37, I get 0.05, which is also 5%. The capital gain yield. What's the price at the end of the year? Oh, come on, you guys can't read. 40.33. And what do we pay for that thing at the beginning of the year? 37. So that top part, 40.33 minus 37, gives us our capital gain in dollars of $3.33 per share. I divide that by the price at the beginning of the year, and that gives us 0.09 or 9%. Are you with me so far? Now, we said if you want total percentage return, all you've got to do is add those two together. And when we do that, we get 14%. Now we could check our work here. If I take the total dollar return and divide by the total initial investment, I get exactly 14%. If you don't, there's something wrong. Now did we need to know the number of shares in order to calculate total dollar return? No. Swing and a miss. We did. Remember, we had total, but we, we found it per share, and then we had to multiply by the number of shares to figure out it was 518. Remember, it was $5.18 per share. The question is, do we need to know the number of shares to do percentage return? No. And so, you and I are back at the cocktail party talking about investments, as we will. And you say to me, so, how's your, uh, how's your portfolio doing? And I say, well, I've got a return of 14%. Do you know to be impressed or not? Yes and no. On the one hand, you know 14% is a pretty good return. On the other hand, you're going to now ask me, well, how much did you invest and get that 14%? And I say, $100. And you say, oh, so in other words, you could buy us lunch at Taco Bell, mm -hmm. right? Or if I said $1 million, now you start to think about how I could buy you a car, right? Does that make sense? And so neither one of these things has all of the information that we might need to tell us everything we want to know. Well, which one of these do you think we talk about more? Yeah, the percentage returns. Percentage returns is going to apply to everybody in this room. So uh, I'm going to tell you a weird story about my family here. Christmas time, we always get together and talk about how our portfolios are doing. And we don't discuss numbers because that's gauche, right? <laughs> but we always talk about percentages, and I'm always glad when I can top my sister because she, she has someone do her stuff, right? And I'm just, it's just like me. In fact, we should talk about how much she's paying in fees. She may be returning lower than she even thinks. Back to the story. Percentage returns, we're all on the same page there. It doesn't matter how much you invested, you can get an idea of how much it's increased. So that's why we always talk about percentage returns. And I have to turn the sound off. Every time my dogs go outside, I get a pain. Okay, now we have here a chart. And this chart shows us returns on different things over a time period starting December 31st, 1925. And you might think that's a really weird time to pick to start. The reason is the first good records that we have for all of these things that are up here is January 1st, 1926. Now, we were trading stocks 300 years ago under the Buttonwood tree in New York City. Unfortunately, do you think they have really good records of the trades that were made? No, not really. 
And so uh, that's why this data starts uh, January 1st, 1926. And this chart itself goes up through 2013. And if you updated it till today, the order would still hold. So let's talk about, let's start at the very old. And there's one more thing I want to tell you about this chart. Normal charts, we have like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Or 0, 100, 200, 300, 400. What does a vertical axis on this one look like? You got 0 to 1, and then 1 to 10, and then 10 to 100. This is called a logarithmic scale. A logarithmic scale. If you want to sound fancy at the next car, uh, cocktail party, you could discuss the importance of always showing returns on log or uh, values on a logarithmic scale. And the reason we do that is because what this does is makes 10% return down low look identically the same as 10% return up top. Otherwise, this thing would end up with some weird curve, and it would be very hard for us to interpret and read. And so, basically, what we've done by using this logarithmic scale is to turn dollar amounts into returns, which we can look at and understand. Okay, now, um, at the very bottom, we have inflation. Inflation, by the way, not something that you should be investing in, but inflation is important because it erodes the purchasing power of our money. If, uh, and you guys are like the first class I've had they actually know that to be true. Everyone else, when they talk about when I talk about inflation, they freak out and they're like, "That's nothing real. Why are you even talking about that?" But you guys know, right? Okay. So inflation. What could buy you? What you could buy with a dollar in 1926 was going to cost you twelve dollars and eighty-one cents in 2013, and that makes a lot of sense based on some conversations I had with my grandfather, who was. 11 years old in 1926, and he was fond of telling me the ridiculous small amounts of money he spent on things like Coke and candy bars and whatnot. Okay, so that's inflation. That's our baseline. The thing right above that is the Treasury bill. Now, you guys haven't probably... Uh, do you know what a Treasury bill is? It's the short-term debt of the United States federal government. Treasury bill is the short-term debt of the United States federal government. And let's talk about the kinds of risks that you face when you loan money to people. What's your big risk when you loan a buddy uh, 50 bucks and he says he'll pay you his next payday? What's the big risk? The default risk. Yeah, the default. And also, the, yeah. it's the same thing, right? So there's default risk. And what's the other kind of risk? This one's a little trickier. It's called price risk or interest rate risk. And the reason we have that is because the value of anything is the present value of the future cash flows discounted at a rate appropriate to the risk. And so when you loan someone money, you are agreeing to receive a set future value. But if the rates in the market go up while you're holding on to that debt, you now have something that's worth less. Does that make sense? Okay, so these are the two kinds of risk that we run into when we loan money. And this one is magnified, I can spell here, magnified by time. The longer this loan is outstanding, the more price risk you have. So take a look over here. You can see that if it's a very short term thing, that this little change in R is only going to get magnified to a very low power. For instance, we're looking at three month treasury bills here. This T would be 0.25. And so whatever little change we have in R gets magnified to the point to buy power. But what if we were looking at loaning money out for 30 years? What would T be? 30. Any little change we have here will be magnified to the 30th power. Do you see how the interest rate risk or price risk is much greater when you've got a long time to maturity? Now let's talk about 
why Treasury bills return so very little. The reason that Treasury bills return so very little is because they have so very little risk. <clears throat> they are only outstanding for three months. And so the T is 0.25. And let's talk about default risk in the United States government. In theory, is there any default risk with the United States government? No, why not? They can print their own money. Um, that's number one, and it's the worst possible answer because if you print a bunch of money, what happens? Yeah, inflation. You're living with it, folks. That's what we've been doing. Look at those printing presses. I'm surprised they haven't caught fire, right? Okay, now, a, a more sustainable way to do this would be to raise taxes. Now, in a democracy, when you tell people you're going to raise their taxes, what typically happens? Yeah, they vote you out. Uh, you guys probably weren't alive then, 1984. Walter Mondale got up. He was running for president against Reagan. He got up and says, yeah, I'm going to raise your taxes. He didn't even carry his own home state. Pretty pathetic, right? Okay. So democracy is democracy's really hard to do that. And so that's what we're really going to lean on here is this ability to print your own money. And that's exactly why we're in our current situation. Now, do you think the U.S. government has ever defaulted on its debt? Ms. Ware says yes. When? Um, with China. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, no, no. Didn't, like, JP Morgan, like, bail out the government or something? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, let's, let's go further back. I, I'll just let you all off the hook. Let's go back in history. The year is 1789. Yeah, I think 1789. What's going on? the Constitution that Yeah, yeah. So it's about that time. We had this war. We had a war with the British. Do you guys know yeah. this from history? Okay. So... <laughs> It's why we speak. It's why we speak English, right? Okay. So we had this war with the British, and uh, the French loaned us a bunch of money to fight the war. Now, is that because French people love us? Uh, yeah. French people hate everyone. They just hated us less than they hated the British, right? Because they're fighting wars with the British elsewhere, and so they thought, hey. hey if we give the Americans a little money, they can cause trouble for the British. So, poop, there you go. And so they loaned us all this money. We fought the war. We defeated the British. They also sent some troops, by the way. And then we have the big end of the war party. And the French, by the way, I'm taking uh, some liberties here with the truth. Um, we have a big end of the war party. And the French show up and they say, ha, 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 congratulations. My French accent. Give us our money. It what? It Give was? Us Give us our money. Give us our money. Exactly. <laughs> and, and we say, thank you. And they say, ha ha. Give us our money. And we say, and we pull our pockets out. And we say, you know, we spent all that money to defeat the British. And we're just a bunch of poor dirt farmers. Which was true. Right? We weren't lying. A bunch of poor dirt farmers. We didn't even have our own currency at that point. Do you know what currency we were using? The Spanish dollar. We were using the Spanish dollar. So we didn't have the opportunity to go out and print up a bunch of Spanish dollars because after all, we're not Spain. Now, there were some paper money that was issued by the Continental Congress. And by this time, people were using it to start fires and wipe their behinds because they figured it would never be worth anything. Big joke, because eventually it was, and those people are like, right? They're like digging, digging up the old outhouse. Pretty gross, isn't it? Okay, so long story short, we have defaulted on our debt. Now uh, it's less likely because we actually print our own money. Does that make sense? Okay, now one of the things you have to do if you're going to do that, though, is only issue debt denominated in your own currency. Now, what if your currency is volatile and let's say Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe is just poo, massive inflation, horribly cheap currency. No one wants to loan money to Zimbabwe in their own currency. They loan, we loan to them in dollars. They can't print dollars, right? And so they wind up right back where we were at with the French. Does that make sense? 
Okay, now, we put those two things together, there's very little default risk, there's very little price or interest rate risk with United States Treasury bills, so they have very little return. Although a dollar invested January 1st, 1926 would have given you $20.57 at the end of 2013. So, you know, that sounds pretty good. And it's better than inflation, which was would have only given us $12.81. Or it was $12.81. So we have increased our ability to consume. We would say there was a positive real rate of return here because the return is in excess of interest or of, of inflation. Okay. Now, the next one up, oh, by the way, I want you to notice the roughness or smoothness of the treasury bill line. Look at all these lines and tell me which is the smoothest other than inflation. Treasury, treasury bills. On a chart like this, you can see risk as roughness because risk is, I don't know where the price is going to be tomorrow, right? And something that has very little risk it's going to go very smoothly and it's easy for you to know what it's going to be worth tomorrow because it's not risky. Now, if something is very risky, you don't know what it's going to be worth tomorrow. And the riskier it is, the less certain you are about the value or even the value range of the thing tomorrow. Which tells us that when you are young, you can afford to take on more risk when you're saving for your retirement because you don't need that money tomorrow. In fact, right now, I'll tell you about my, my portfolio here in a little bit, but uh, I'm definitely not in treasury bills. It would be crazy for me because I'm not gonna need that money for at least another 15 years. Does that make sense? Okay, now let's talk about the next thing up. <coughs> Long-term government bonds. By the way, these are the, let's say, 30-year bonds of the United States government. Exactly the same government that we had for treasury bills. So what does that tell us about the default risk? It's theoretically zero, right? But we do have this price or interest rate risk because now we're going to the 30th power. And so there's a much greater risk that a change in interest rate is going to impact the value of your investment. And so that's the only difference between these two is that price or interest rate risk. And you can see if you invested a dollar in 1926, you'd end up with $123.12. That's like six times as much, six times as much. And it all comes down to this risk that you're facing here. By the way, if you haven't figured this out yet, risk and return must go together. Risk and return must go together. In my hometown, there were three basic industries. There were bed springs, cheese, and dynamite. Which one of you think, which one of those do you think paid the best? Dynamite, dynamite plant. That's why both my grandfathers, my father and my uncle worked at the dynamite plant, right? And so risk and return have to go together whether it's on the job or in the securities market. So that's why we're seeing these long-term government bonds returning more of the treasury bonds bills because they are riskier. Now, there is something missing from this chart, and it would be corporate bonds. Corporate bonds should be somewhere between long-term government bonds and large company stocks. How do I know that corporate bonds should return more than long-term government bonds? Because not only do they have this risk, they also have this risk. Do companies ever go bankrupt? Yes. Oh yeah. And so you've got both of these for corporate bonds. But how do I know, stop that. How do I know that the return is going to be less than large company stocks? Let's think back to the order of payment at corporations. And in the front you've got the government, and then you've got employees, suppliers, you've got debt holders, you've got preferred shareholders, and at the very back of the line, you've got the common shareholders. Who's got the riskier position? The bondholders who get paid first, or the shareholders who get the leftovers? Ah, it's the shareholders, right? They got the riskier position. So we know that stocks for the same company will always be riskier than their bonds. So that's why in between long-term government bonds and large company stocks, we should see corporate bonds. And then we get up to large company stocks. 
And we see that if we invested a dollar in January 1st, 1926, we end up with $3,532.56 at the end. Is that a big difference? That's huge. That is a huge difference. Why are we getting so much more return? Because this stuff is riskier. Now, I've had students before say, well, wait a minute, this is only looking at companies that survive. So there's survivorship bias. Wrong. This is survivorship bias free data. In other words, this not only includes the ones that did really well, it includes the ones that crashed and burned. Large company stocks you can think of like the S&P 500. And then at the very top, if we invest a dollar back in the day, now it's worth $18,364.60. Man, is that big? Oh yeah. Now, what would that tell you about small company stocks versus large company stocks? Yeah, they're riskier. Can you give me any reasons why small companies should be riskier than large ones? Higher default risk, why? Uh, large institutions, can, uh, they have the ability to bring in more revenues and have better access to cash flow and future bonds. And really yeah, so if you're going to, would you rather loan money to Microsoft or to some small software company that just listed on, on, the, on the exchange? I'd rather lend money to Microsoft. Easier for them to go out and borrow money. Very good. What else? One of the things we're going to talk about in this class, in fact, it's in the next chapter, is the importance of a diversified portfolio. If you've got a small company, chances are they're only doing one thing. So let's take an example here. Um, GE, General Electric, has a wind power business. In fact, I know the CEO of their land wind power business. He refuses to link with me on LinkedIn. I understand it. <laughs> He knew me like 25 years ago. Back to the story. Um, so they've got these windmills that they're doing, but how much of a percentage of GE's business, business is that? It's small. GE's and all sorts of other things. They make jet engines. They make turbines for power plants. They do all sorts of different things. And so you can think of GE's business as being a diversified portfolio. And what do we know about diversified portfolios? They are safer than undiversified portfolio. Now let's compare this with a small startup wind power company, San Jose, California. They only are doing wind power. And let's assume that government subsidies get yanked from the wind power business, which by the way, that's the only reason that anyone builds a windmill is because of government subsidies and this carbon trading stuff, which I'm going to make a discussion out of. But if, if you let the free market rule, uh, suddenly wind power is not viable. And what happens to the demand for windmills? Boop, it goes away. Now, uh, it, for GE, it would be a rounding error in their overall business. But what about for the startup? It's the whole enchilada, right? They're dead. And so that's another reason why we might see large companies be safer than small ones. They might be more diversified. Also, how do you get to be a big company? Unless you're started by the government, big companies all started out as small companies. And so they have a record of success. They are more likely to have professional managers. In fact, let's talk about the small business. When someone has a brainstorm, like uh, let's say Steve Wozniak. Do you guys know who Steve Wozniak is? One of the co-inventors of Apple. Steve Wozniak, technical genius. Would he have been any good at running a company? No. no. In fact, that's why Steve Jobs ended up being the guy that was in charge, because Wozniak, technically a genius, far smarter than Steve Jobs ever hoped to be, but terrible at running a business. My point to you is this, entrepreneurs often have an amazing idea, something that will change humanity as we know it, but terrible at running a business. And so until we get into that professional management stage of a company's life, which often happens when it gets larger, 
then we have the risk of the managers just not knowing what they're doing. Example, Adam Newman at WeWork. If you don't know what, who that is, look it up. It's just a crazy story. I think they did a movie about him on Hulu. Okay, now I had a student say to me, well, wait a minute, this, this small company stocks, does that include the ones that die? And I say, yeah. And he's like, wow, what if we could only invest in the ones that were going to live? I said, that's brilliant. <laughs> Why don't you come to my office and tell me which ones those are? Where's your time machine? What's that? Where's your time machine? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And this is exactly what I tell students at the end of the semester when things are right about to be done. And they're like, what can I do to improve my grade? And I say, build a time machine, right? Because you're going to have to go back and, yeah, you didn't think that was funny, did you? Okay. <laughs> back to the story. We don't know. So I went alligator hunting in Louisiana. And uh, when we would come upon a long alligator, the Cajuns would say, whoa, he must be really smart. What's the connection between the length of an alligator and how smart they are? Yeah, you have to go, you have to survive some pretty egregious stuff to get up to be a 12-foot alligator. Does that make sense? And so the smart ones live longer. Now you say, well, wait a minute. What if I could just invest in those? Well, you can't. But what if I have a a kiddie pool? This is going to be a disturbing image, by the way. A kiddie pool with 30 baby alligators. How could I maximize my chances of getting a 12-footer? Buy them all, right? Buy them all. And that's what I do. So let me tell you where my portfolio is today. And when I say my, it's also my wife's money because we manage, I manage all of our money together. Okay. So we've got large company stocks. I'm in the S&P 500. I am also, and, and my fund money uh, is in small company stocks, S&P 600. And you say, why don't you pick individual stocks? We will find out as we go along. I will tell you exactly. And if you came here hoping to learn how to pick stocks, I have bad news for you. I am not going to teach you that. And the reason I'm not going to teach you that is because I don't know how. And the reason I don't know how is because nobody does. <laughs> right? I'm not saying I know everything, but I know enough to know that. Any questions about risk and return? What happens to the roughness of these lines as we go up? Yeah, they get rougher and rougher, and that's a sign of risk. So that's a visual representation of risk. Now we're going to move on, and we're going to see what happens with time and stock returns. Because a lot of people think they can tell by what happened in the past what's going to happen in the future. And in fact, you'll have people who look at these stock charts, and they will tell you things like, oh yeah, I can tell by this pattern that the stock is getting ready to break out. Do you think those people know anything? Well, they're absolutely full of crap. You can look at the pattern and you can see whatever you want. We have actually done experiments on this, giving random patterns to people and getting them to say what's going to happen next, and they can't. In fact, they're right less than half the time. All we ask them is up or down. And they're right less than half the time, which statistically it should be half the time, right? We also give them pieces of real stock charts and ask them to do this, and they still can. Still less than half the time they can tell us what's going to happen. It reminds me of my sister and me when we were little kids. So uh, poor kids, no cable TV, so what do we do? We go out and lay in the field and look up at the sky, and we see these clouds. And there'd be a cloud, and she'd say, oh, oh, that one's a horse. And I'd say, no, that's a dog. Who was right? Neither one of us. It's a freaking cloud, right? <laughs> and that's what's going on with these people who think they can look at a chart and tell what's going to happen next. I will demonstrate that now through looking at returns in different years. Up top, we have large company stocks. In the bottom, we have small company stocks. And this is what's called a histogram. And a histogram is where you form buckets. In this case, we've got buckets of their 10% increments of return. And for each one of those buckets, we have put the year of the returns for that year in the histogram. 
And so we can look and see that 1926, the return was between what two numbers? 10 and 20. And so 1926, your friends say, whoa, I got between 10 and 20% last year, so I'm going to go more in. And uh, 1927 rolls around, and your friend has now between 30 and 40. You haven't put any money in yet. And they're saying, you're an idiot. You haven't put any money in yet, and you're still quite cautious. Uh, 1928 rolls around, what happens? 40 to 50 percent. You are finally sold. So you put all your money in. 1929, where's the return? Between zero and minus 10 percent. You say, well, surely this is just a, an anomaly. By the way, what happened in 1929? Well, the Wall Street crash happens in 1929, which kicks off the Great Depression, right? So the crash happens, but when does the crash happen? The crash happens in October. And so there's been lots of positive returns during the year. That's why it's only mildly negative. But you say, well, I'm sure this is just a minor correction, so I pile in even more money. What happens in 1930? Between minus 20 and minus 30 percent. I say, there's no way we could have another year this bad. What happens in 1931? It gets worse. It gets worse between minus 40 and minus 50. And I say, you know, I'm going to give it one more year. Where's 1932? Yeah, between 0 and negative 10, right above 1929. Now I say, you know what? Forget it. I'm going to sell what's left of my stock. I'm going to put the money in a mayonnaise jar in my backyard. And I'm just going to forget this whole stock market thing. What happens in 1933? <laughs> oh, man. Do you see you can't tell what's going to happen next year? And the reason we can't tell what's going to happen next year is we don't know what's going to happen in the world. Why did gas prices recently go through the roof? Russia, Russia did something naughty, right? They invaded, the, uh, invaded Ukraine, and that caused all sorts of troubles because Russia has, I think, the world's biggest oil reserves at this point. It goes back and forth. But they are a big exporter of oil. Now. Um, I saw this coming, but only like two months beforehand. Did you guys see it coming any more than two, more, two months beforehand? Maybe. Maybe? Oh, OK. Uh, fair disclosure, uh, Ms. Volkova is from that part of the world, right? So she hears stuff that the rest of us do. By the way, warn us if they're going to come over here, please. OK, back to the story. Back to the story. You can't see this stuff coming. What about the September 11th terrorist attacks? There were like maybe 25 people that knew that stuff was going to go down, right? You can't foresee that. You don't know what's going to happen. OK, now, I want you to notice something about this histogram. It has a sort of a shape to it. What does the shape look like? Kind of a bell shape. And we say that stock returns are, we, we we start with the assumption that they are normally distributed. So there's the normal distribution. And if you look at large stocks, it kind of looks that way. Then we get down to small stocks. And you say, wait a minute, small stocks, mm, not quite as clean. It's not. But there's a lot of crazy stuff going on with small stocks. And the other thing I would tell you is, in order to prove whether stock returns are normally distributed, we would need thousands and thousands of data points. We only have since 1926, right? So we really don't have a good feel for that. Uh, so we just make assumptions. And one of those assumptions is that stocks are normally distributed. Now I want you to notice something about um, large stocks versus small stocks. Large stocks are running from negative 50 up to positive 60. What have we got on small stocks? From negative 60 all the way up to 150. Now, notice that you've got more outliers in both directions, more, more uh, observations in both directions. That's a sign of risk. Now, as a result, we know, though, that the, the return for small stocks has to be greater than that for large stocks. And you can kind of see it right here. You can kind of see it if it were truly normally distributed, that sample, then we would be able to see it for sure. Questions? Okay, so 
If someone tells you, I can look at a stock chart and tell you where the stock is going, what is the appropriate response? Bullshit, right? <laughs> That's the appropriate response. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious, what happened, how could it happen in just two years that it went from the extreme end to a another extreme what happened in those three years? Okay, so typically what happens is we, we, we do have an economic cycle, right? And uh, the economic cycles since the Great, in fact, we used to have lots of Great Depression like events prior to 1913. Do you know what happened in 1913? Yeah, it's the founding of the Federal Reserve Bank. No matter how much you hate or love the Fed, know this. They did put an end to these weird exaggerated economic cycles, except for the Great Depression. But the way any economic cycle works is things are going good, things are going good. What happens to asset prices? Yeah, and they actually get inflated, right? We get these asset bubbles. And in fact, we're right uh, four six months ago, we were in a stock bubble. Yeah. And back in 2008, we were in a real estate bubble. Always happens when you end up in a, in a positive stroke on the cycle. Now, what inevitably happens? Yeah, there's going to be a recession. There's going to be a recession. And do we know how long the recession is going to last? No. And so, and, and by the way, we're going to have a recession, and I can't tell you how long it's going to last. But what do you think happens to stock prices when the recession happens? Yeah, they, they get cheap fast. Now, what do you think, instead of a recession, what if you had a depression? Now they're going to go vroom. But what do we know about economic cycles? Yeah, eventually they're going to bounce back. Eventually they're going to bounce, bounce back. And what happened in 1933 is that people finally became convinced that the recovery was in full swing. And so, you're going to see that after we, when we go through this next recession, you're going to see stock prices come down. And then along the way, you're going to see something creep in. It's called hope. <laughs> then we're going to start to see stock prices go up. Now, by the way, can you wait for concrete evidence that the uh, recession is over before you put your money in? No, because everybody else is going to do that too, right? And so what you end up with are what we call a dead cap bounce which is where stuff goes down, and then you'll see it bounce back up because some people are betting that it's almost over, and then it's not. And so the cat hits the pavement again. I'm not kidding, that cat bounce is what they call that. And so, but eventually, enough people join in with the hope that it actually causes asset prices to go up. By the way, what do you think this hope does to the overall economy? Yeah, it boosts, it boosts so it's the wealth effect. Um, my, my portfolio is worth more now, so maybe I can afford that new car. Maybe we can move to that nice house in the suburbs. Does that make sense? And so it actually does impact the real economy. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions? Now, let's talk about the risk premium. Earlier, I told you that we can invest in treasury bills at basically zero risk because they have no default risk and they only have this uh, little bit of price risk. And so that is the only thing you can buy and get a return for not taking any risk. But, and we call that, that's our proxy for the risk-free asset. And so if you ever hear uh, someone talk about the risk-free asset, What I want you to think is three-month T-bill. Three-month T-bill is your risk-free asset. That's your proxy. Proxy is a stand-in. Do we actually have a risk-free asset? No. Closest thing we have to it is the three-month U.S. T-bill. Okay. If you invest in something else and you get a higher return, the difference between the return on that thing and the return on the risk-free asset must be a reward for taking risk. Let me say that again. 
If you're getting a higher return than the risk-free asset, that amount over and above the uh, risk-free return is a reward for taking a risk. We call it the risk premium, the risk premium. You guys ever watch a show called American Greed? American Greed, I love this show. Uh, so one of the most common uh, schemes you see is people, it's the Ponzi scheme, and the way they get people involved in a Ponzi scheme is they, in, they say you're going to get higher returns with no risk. If you ever have someone offer you an investment with high returns and no risk, what is the appropriate response? Bullshit, Bullshit right? It just doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. And so the only way they're able to pay these returns is by taking the money from new investors and paying out returns to the older investors. Is that sustainable? No. And so you wind up with a situation where things go south and someone ends up in prison and a bunch of people end up poor. Now, what does that mean for you? It means that when someone offers you something and you see the percentage return on it, you need to think, aha, most of that is a compensation for bearing risk. By the way, these Ponzi schemers, you add, they, and it's always, they prey on the old people, right? They prey on old people. And the old people say, is this insured by the FDIC? Do you guys know what the FDIC is? Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation? And these guys will always say, no, but we have insurance through Lloyd's of London. Have you guys heard of Lloyd's of London? Doesn't that sound fancy? Doesn't it sound official? It's total crap. But they've got some Xerox certificate that someone made up long ago that says these accounts insured by Lloyd's of London. It's all crap. OK. So don't believe it. If, it. if the risk is, if the rate of return is higher than the risk-free rate, then there is risk in the investment. Okay, any questions? So the risk premium, we can figure out for any asset. All we got to do is take the expected return of that asset and subtract the risk-free rate, and that gives us the risk premium. We could talk about the risk premiums for individual stocks. We could talk about the risk premiums for the, in the, the, for the entire market, which would be the market risk premium. But we'll talk about that more in a bit. Now, let's look at some different uh, returns and some different histograms for different kinds of, of um, assets here. And we're going to start, I'm going to give you a little preview here. We're going to have to have a mathematical measure of risk. And the mathematical measure of risk that we're going to use is standard deviation. Hopefully you guys have all had a statistics class. You know what standard deviation is. It's a measure of dispersion. And when you're looking at a distribution, like a normal distribution, you have, if you've got very little risk, your standard deviation is going to be low, and this thing's going to be tall and skinny like a Christmas tree. And so look at U.S. Treasury bills. Very tall and skinny like a Christmas tree, right? That's very little risk because it's, you know, it may be here, it may be here, but that's it. As, standard devi as risk grows, standard deviation grows, and what we see is the distribution start to spread out. And so now there's more of a chance you're going to have stuff uh, further away from the mean. That's risk. And so the higher the standard deviation, the riskier the asset. The higher the standard deviation, the riskier the asset. And another thing, another name that we call this is volatility. This risk that's measured by standard deviation we call volatility. Volatility. Yeah, there we go. So, if you hear that something's really volatile, that means it's risky. Now, let's take a look here. We will start at the bottom and work our way up. Actually, let's we'll skip inflation, forget inflation. Um, United States Treasury bills have an average return of 3.6% and a standard deviation of 3.1. If you looked at that information, can anyone tell me what the risk-free rate is? 3.6? Yeah, 3.6%. That means we can find the risk premium on any of these other things by subtracting 3.6% on it, and that would give us the risk 
premium. Does that make sense? Okay, so uh, let's talk about the next thing. Uh, and forget intermediate term bonds. By the way, let's not forget them too much. Uh, intermediate term bonds, why do you think they have a lower uh, return than long term government bonds? Yeah, they're, they're less risky. So let's say that they're out here for 15 years, they have less price or interest rate risk than the 30 year bonds. That's why their returns have to be lower. Now, notice that they've got a return of 5.5 and a standard deviation of 5.6. Both the return and the standard deviation are higher. That makes perfect sense because the risk is higher. Then we have long-term government bonds. And once again, we see a higher return and a higher standard deviation. They have to return more because they're riskier. Now, let's ask this question. Can anyone tell me what is the risk premium for long-term government bonds? How would I calculate that? 6.1 minus 2.5. Do you have a question? No, I was just going to say how much. Oh, yeah, it shouted out. Uh, it's Everyone 2. else. 2.8 for the long term. Or for the long term government bonds. How about 2.5? 2, 2. Yeah, yeah 2.5. Yeah. yeah, it just shouted out. Everyone else is going to mumble. So just go for it, right? Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, what about long term corporate bonds? We discussed that long-term corporate bonds should have a higher return than long-term government bonds. Why? Default risk. Yeah, default risk. Now, we know they're riskier, but check out the standard deviation. Is there something wrong here? Yeah, this is what we call an anomaly. That standard deviation should be higher, but it's actually lower. Makes no sense whatsoever. It doesn't fit with our theory. It doesn't fit with the math. Do, am I ever going to be able to explain to you why that's the way it is? No. We don't have a good reason for why that's the way it is. And I, uh, I checked at one point just because I thought it might be a misprint, but it's not. Right? Okay. Now, moving on to large, large company stocks. Uh, what's the risk premium on large company stocks? Eight point two. Very good. Thank you. Now, notice the standard deviation on large company stocks. By the way, uh, the return goes from on the bonds six point four almost doubles to large company stocks. What happens to the standard deviation? More than doubles. So we see that the increase in the risk goes along with the increase in the standard deviation. And finally at the top, we have 16.5% return for small company stocks. Check out that standard deviation, 32.3. Makes all the sense in the world. The only thing out there that doesn't make sense is the long-term corporate bond because of that weird standard deviation. Now notice what happens to these things as we get riskier and riskier. Look at that distribution. Starts out when we're very safe, it looks like this, and it just gets lower and lower and lower until when we get to small stocks, it starts to look like a fried egg. You guys know about fried eggs? It's very flat, right, with just a slight hump in the middle. That's incredibly risky. Questions? Now, you say, wait a minute, small stocks are incredibly risky. Why do you invest in them? In fact, let's say, who would be good for investing in small company stocks? Young people. Young people. Very good. Because you guys can survive the ups and downs. Does that make sense? I had a neighbor that was retiring just as COVID hit. And you should have seen just the color leave his face as he watched the market plunge. And I said, hey, by the way, he was also my colleague. I said, you're a finance professor. Undoubtedly, you moved some of your assets into fixed assets long ago. He said, no. <laughs> right? Was that, you don't do that. And uh, even worse than that, I had a coworker who, this is back in the dot-com boom. The dot-com boom, this guy invested all his money in, uh, in internet stocks. And he would show up every day at the office and tell us how much his portfolio was worth. It was really annoying. And he'd come in, he's like, today it's 2.1 million. And I'd say, okay, Kenneth, what are you invested in? He's like, internet stocks. I'm like, bro, you need to diversify your portfolio. He's like, yeah, screw it. Okay, 
Then what happens? March 2000? Shaboom. And then after that, it was me asking Kenneth every day, Kenneth, what's your portfolio worth? <laughs> At last report, it was worth $100,000. Now, it was a problem for Kenneth because he was 62 years old. What do you think Kenneth was planning to do with that two point something million? Retire on it. Do you think Kenneth was able to retire? No, I figured he died trying to sell plastic pellets. That's what we did, we sold plastic pellets. So, questions? So, we talked a little bit about this. We need a mathematical measure of risk. And if you think back to your, uh, by the way, QBA something or other, did you guys have to take a statistics class? No. Raise your hand if you did not have to take a statistics class. You didn't have to take, <gasps> okay, if you have trouble, let me know, right? Okay, so do you know about mean, standard deviation, and variance? Oh, she thinks so. I think the education was probably better where she grew up. At least mathematics. Were you allowed to use calculators in school? Oh, there you go, there's your answer. Okay, back to the story. There are two measures of dispersion that we talk about in statistics. We talk about standard deviation and variance. What is the relationship between standard deviation and variance? Square root. Square root. So the standard deviation is the square root of the variance. And so in theory, you could use either one of these to describe the risk involved in purchasing stock. But we use, we choose to talk about standard deviation. And here's the reason why. Standard deviation is in units we can understand. It's in the same units as return. Standard deviation is in the same units as return. We can understand that. Also, standard deviation, we're going to see, is necessary for defining our normal distribution. If I know the mean and I know the standard deviation, I can create the entire normal distribution. Now, uh, let's say that returns are in percentages, that means standard deviation is in percent. What is variance in terms of unit-wise? If standard deviation is percent, variance has to be percent squared. Can you interpret percent squared? You know, I have a PhD in finance, and they made me take all sorts of statistical doctoral level classes, and guess what? I still can't interpret percent squared. So there's your reason why. Uh, it's, it's in units we understand. It's easier for us to interpret. And then, of course, we also use it for the normal distribution. Now, for any of these, the greater they are, the greater the risk. The greater they are, the greater the risk. And of course, the standard deviation is greater, so is variance. Okay, let's get our calculators out. Let's get our calculators out. So did your calculator work after did, after we purified it? Okay, very good. Oh. Yeah, I'll get it here in a minute. Oh yeah. Well, it's just sugar. Oh, now it's like every time. Hey. I d I think maybe it's listening and it hears you guys talking. I don't know. Obviously, you're more interesting than I am. Okay, so here we go. Now let's talk about what we've got here. We've got four returns for a stock, year one, two, three, and four. In year one, it's returning 13.7%. In year two, it's returning 35.8%. In year three, it's returning 45.14%, at which point I would invest. And what happens in year four? Negative 8.88%. That's losing money, right? Okay, so this is a sample of returns for this firm. Is it all the returns? No. 
And so we are going to calculate sample standard deviation. There are two kinds of statistics that we talk about, and they are sample uh, statistics and they are population statistics. If I know everything about every one, then I can do population statistics. But even if I knew historically all the returns from the company, I still couldn't use population statistics because basically what we are viewing is somewhat random, random outcomes out of a process. And if we could replay it again, we would get probably different returns. And so no matter how many returns, how far back we have, we still are calculating sample standard deviations for those things. Okay. Now, the first thing we're going to do is convert that into decimals. Does everyone here know how to convert a percentage to a decimal? Mr. Green, what's the magic to make this happen? Two decimal places in the world. Uh, well, uh, let's just say divide by 100, right? Sure. Divide by 100. Divide by 100. So we've got 0.137 for 13.7%. We've got 0.358. We've got 0.4514, and then we've got negative 0.08888. Now, that's the first step, convert into decimals. Now, we are going to find the arithmetic mean. The arithmetic mean is a fancy term for average, and everyone's mom and grandma even knows how to do this one. Um, how are we going to calculate the average of these returns? Yeah, we're going to add them together and divide by four. And why four? Because that's how many. Yeah. So we're going to add up all the observations and divide by the number of observations. So when I add all these things together, I get 0.8576. And if I divide 0.8576 by four, I get 0.2144. And if I wanted to convert that back to percent, all I have to do is multiply by 100. And I can see that our average return here is 21. 0.44%. Have I blown your mind yet? Mr. Green says yes. yes. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, if, if you're having trouble at this point, we really need to talk. Now, this is where it gets sticky. This is where it gets sticky. So, here's what we're going to do. For every return, we're going to figure out how far away from the mean is that return. And that's going to be our deviation for each one. So that's going to be the first thing that we calculate for each of these. And we are going to take 0.1370 and we're going to subtract that mean return of 0.2144. And in fact, let's go ahead and get the calculator out and do that right now. 0.137 minus our average return of 0.2144. And I'm getting negative 0.0774, which is exactly what they have here. If we go down through here and repeat that process over and over and over again, we are going to get those down below. Now, we have to be careful on that last one. We have to go ahead and make sure that it's negative 0.0888 and then subtract 0.2144. That's, why, that's how we get this. If we just do 8.88%, we're not going to get the right answer. It has to be negative. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, why am I stopping at this point? Because I want to tell you that the easy way to do this, uh, what, what do most students do? They write down all the deviations, not keeping the numbers in their calculators. And then for the next step, we are going to square these. And they will square them and they will write down those numbers. Why is that a bad idea? It's time consuming. You can make mistakes and you've probably got rounding error because there may be things out beyond what you're trying to calculate. And so what we're going to do is we're not, so every student has the desire to work vertically. We're going to work horizontally. And so here we are at minus 0.0774. By the way, if I add up all of those deviations, they add to zero. And so telling me what the average deviation isn't going to help. What I'm really, I'm not actually interested whether I'm negative or positive, I'm just interested in how far away. Now I could just do absolute value for all those deviations and find the average of that. And that would be the mean 
absolute deviation or mad. Nobody uses that. Instead, what we do is we square all these deviations. What happens to the negatives when we square? They go away, right? Because a negative times a negative is positive. And so that's what we do. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, by the way, do you see the little button that says x squared? Bam. There we go. Do you see that this is the same number? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say store 1. And then I've got 0 0.358 minus 0 0.2144 equals 0.1436. What do I do next? Square it. And then what do I do? Store 2. Clear. 0.4514 minus 0.2144 equal 0.237. What do I do? Square. Square it. And then what do I do? Store three. Store three. And then finally, I have 0.0888. What do I need to do next? Yeah, we've got to hit the plus minus key. Make that thing negative. Minus... 0.2144 equal, and I've got minus 0 0.3032. What do I do next? Square. Square it. And then what do I do? Store. Very good. Store four. Now, we have all the deviations squared. And so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add all of those together to come up with, and this is really imaginatively named. It's the sum of squared deviations. Does that tell you what's going on here? We squared those deviations, and now we're going to add them all together. Sum of squared deviations. And so I'm just going to, oh, by the way, can someone tell me how I can get this stuff back out of my calculator and add it together? Recall one plus. Recall two plus. Recall three plus. Recall four equals. That's my sum of squared deviations, but we're not there yet. Because in order to get standard deviation, sample standard deviation, I have to divide that by n minus 1. What's n? The number. The number of observations, which in this case is 4. So we're going to be dividing by 3. Now you ask, why minus 1? Statisticians tell us that when we calculated that arithmetic mean, we used 1 degree of freedom from the data. Now. Uh, what does that mean in reality? I have no idea. Ask your statistics professor. Degrees of freedom, I don't get it, but I do know this. If we don't subtract that one, we will get the wrong answer, right? <laughs> and so what we're going to do is we're going to divide this by three. That gives me the variance. Now, we have variance, but we want standard deviation. What should we do? Square root. And here's the square root key, and there is my answer, 24.13%. Now, do you think you could replicate that? Good, I, but I have good news, and that is, yeah, we're going to teach you, starting next time, we're going to show up, and the first thing we're going to do is show you how to compute standard deviation using your TIBA2+. It'll be so much easier than what we just did. The bad news is, standard deviation in Chapter 11, we will have to do with the pick and blowtorch method, just like we did. Questions? Okay, see you next time.